Mr. Chairman, I we definitely have quorum. I'm ready to start whenever you are. All right, thanks, Tony. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Spud Woodward, uh, Governor's Appointee Commissioner from Georgia and Chair of the ISFMP Policy Board. And I want to call this meeting of the board to order. Uh, our first item of business is uh, consent with the agenda. That's pretty straightforward. One item agenda. Uh, is there any uh, recommendations from the board to modify the agenda? If so, signify by raising your hand and Tony can recognize you. Give everybody a second or two. We have anything, Tony? I have no hands, Mr. Chair. All right, then we'll consider the agenda accepted by unanimous consent. Next agenda item is public comment. Do we have any members of the public who are listening in who wish to comment on the item on this agenda? Again, uh, signify by raising your hand and you'll be recognized. We have one person. It is Robert Gill. All right, uh, Mr. Gill, I'll give you a couple of three minutes to, to make your comment. So uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Bob Gill, and I appreciate this opportunity. I only take a couple of minutes. I'm a member of the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council, and for those of you that don't know, we are in the very early stages of looking at whether an RSA program might be appropriate for the Gulf. Brandon gave us a, a layout of the Mid-Atlantic's um, current status, seems like forever ago. Uh, but uh, we're looking closely at what y'all are doing, and hopefully that'll provide us some guidance on what may be suitable for us. With that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Bob, and uh, glad to have you listening in. Um, and certainly, uh, if you have some questions later on during the presentation, uh, just let me know, and we'll make sure you get an opportunity to ask those questions. All right. Uh, We'll move on to our action item in the agenda. And for that, I'm going to call on Bob to sort of give us some background and context. And then he will uh, allow Brandon Muffley to uh, come in and give us a presentation on the topic for our consideration. So, Bob, you ready to go? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll make this very brief. I think Brandon's going to hit a lot of the highlights on, you know, where this program has come from and, and where you know what the potential options moving forward are but um the policy board has discussed this issue a couple times and um really hasn't decided the direction they want to move forward um there's as everyone knows rsa program existed for a number of years and brandon will talk about the, the good parts and the bad parts of the previous incarnation of the the research set aside program with that asmoc and the Middle Atlantic Council implemented. Ultimately, it's really a, a council program, but a lot of the pieces of this um, fall on the commission, um, or actually fall on the member states of the commission through enforcement and administrative um, activities, including licensing, et cetera. And then our species management boards had to also mirror actions by the councils to set aside a portion of the quota so that we're working with the same quotas um, uh, from year to year. Um, there, as Brandon will mention, there were a number of enforcement and administrative burdens that, that concerned the states. There was um, some concern that the science that was generated through this program wasn't directly contributing to, or all of it was, some of it was not contributing, I guess it is the best way to say it. Some of the science was not contributing to improving the management of the species that were being um, set aside and, and used to support the, the, the program. So, um, giving the giving the enforcement concerns and the concerns about the quality and 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 use of some of the science, um, the program was discontinued in 2015 and it has been idle since then. Um, and the Mid Atlantic Council spent a lot of time and a number of workshops trying to explore options on on you know if this program moves forward, how should it be modified to address those concerns of the last um, iteration of this program. So the question for the policy board today, and, and we'll have a couple slides on this at the end of Brandon's presentation is, what is this, what, is, what does the commission wanna say to the Mid-Atlantic Council regarding the future of this program? Do we wanna 
sort of wholeheartedly say, you know, go forward and, and continue exploring ways to reinstate the RSA program? Do we, do, are there concerns from the states that um, you want to do the opposite, which is encourage the Mid-Atlantic Council not to move forward with this due to the administrative burdens? Or is there somewhere in the middle where you limit the number of species or limit the number of participants or, um, you know, Conduct, conduct the program differently, significantly different than the last time to make it workable and enforceable, but still, you know, producing valuable science that's needed for across all these species. So I think with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I think the presentation by Brandon will really um, highlight all the details that I kind of uh, went through very quickly here. All right. Thank you, Bob. Any any questions for Bob about the, the background and sort of the context for uh, for for what we're trying to accomplish this afternoon no hands no hands okay very good all right brandon i'll uh, turn it over to you great and thank you mr chairman and thanks to the policy board for giving me an opportunity to to talk to you today it's good to to hear your voices and uh and talk through this i think as bob had indicated <clears throat> this work is really critical you know the collaboration with the commission and state partners on the RSA program is really uh, critical in order for the program to be successful and for it to be carried out. So I appreciate the, the time on the agenda today and that you all are talking about it to provide the, the council with some feedback in regards to where we want to go. So hopefully this, this won't be too long, but I do want to rehash some of the things that Bob had talked about, some of the things that Bob had covered in some previous presentations to the policy board, but to give you a general sense of how the program operated, the work that the, the council took in 2021 and 22 to really dive into the issues and see if we could come up with ways to resolve it, and then where the council is in regards to the continued redevelopment of the program. So we'll start by taking a step back in regards to when the program was, was first developed. So this was really one of the first big uh, omnibus actions for the council. Um, this was framework one to all of our different fishery management plans. Um, so almost all of our council species have an RSA program except for our two clam species. They were already had an ITQ program set up and they were not included in the RSA program, but all of our other species were including those that we jointly manage with the commission. Um, and so we were really trying to, with the program, to meet the unaddressed research needs that we have, right? We all have long lists of research that needs to get done for all of our different fisheries, um, but not enough money to carry out all of those research needs. But I think the second part of the sentence was really important too, was part of the goal of the RSA program was really to get scientists and industry together and talking about um, ways to improve the science that stakeholders um, believed in and trusted in making management decisions. And so I think that was a really critical component of why the RSA program was started. And some of the reasons why I think we sort of lost sight of that, and I'll get into that in a little in a little while. But the, the framework was approved in 2021 and the first projects uh, funded under the RSA program started in 2002. And so the RSA program itself, the founding of it doesn't have any money associated with it, right? We, we have fish, the council doesn't have money to be able to hand out to research, but there, there are fish available. And so what the RSA program does is converts those fish that we do have and converts them into funding. And as had Bob had said, um, what we have typically did, uh, particularly for those jointly managed species, when you all meet in August, um, you would agree to how much of the overall quota or ABC you would set aside for, for the RSA program. And that was anywhere from zero to 3%. And that was consistent across all of our species. So every year, the council, during their spec setting cycle for whatever species they were looking at, they would set aside some portion up to 3% of the quota for, for research. But again, we still have fish. We don't have money yet. Um, and the way we generate money is through compensation fishing, which is actually defined under Magnuson. And it's really just trying to, allowing for fishing operations to occur, but that, but that offset the costs of research um, that has direct application to management. 
And you know, there we you need incentives for fishermen to actually pay to go out to go fishing, right? They already can go out and go fishing for the species that they have permits for. Why would they pay to go out and and do that? And so there are incentives to to allow for that to provide for the funding for the research. And so the incentives really that we have at our disposal are allowing vessels to fish during closed seasons or when a when there's a directed you know, quota, when a state closes a particular quota for a particular period, you know, the RSA program would allow vessels participating in the RSA program to fish when it was closed, or it would allow vessels to have higher uh, possession limits or trip limits. And so those were the things that fishermen were actually paying for, were to get these, these incentives to have additional opportunities to harvest fish. And so given those incentives, right, allowing for folks to fish outside of the season or have higher possession limits, um, it required both federal exempted fishing permits to be issued and typically the state to also have their own uh, exempted fishing permit equivalent, right? I, I know when I was in New Jersey, we didn't have an, exactly an exempted fishing permit, there was a, but there was a permit available to allow vessels to come in and participate in the RSA program. And so what do we do, you know, how did people participate in the program and how did we generate those funds? So we had grant recipients, which were principal investigators. So they would submit a proposal to do um, a particular type of research. And depending upon the research that they were interested in and the species that they were interested, they were given quota that uh, the council and the commission may have set aside for the particular species. And then it was up to the principal investigator to identify partners or fishing vessels to participate and how they would actually generate the funds. It was really all up to the principal investigator to decide that. And they really had two options. And so the first was these bilateral agreements between the principal investigator and the vessel. And this really happened when the vessels and the principal investigator were working together on the research. So the research was happening at the same time that these compensation compensation fishing trips were taking place. And so there was either an agreement um, between the vessel and the principal investigator about how much a particular species the, the vessel would pay, or they would split the proceeds from the landings on that research trip um, and to help fund the particular research. So that was one way to, to provide funds. The other was the principal investigator could take their pounds of fish that they were allocated to support the research and give it to a third party auction. And there, vessels then would bid on these specific quota lots. For example, a thousand pounds of summer flounder or 500 pounds of bluefish, a vessel that's not participating in compensation fishing or working directly with a researcher, they would just buy those lots of quota and allow them then to go out and utilize their thousand pounds of summer flounder how they wanted to either outside of the season or above a state trip limit and so the money raised through the auction then then covered the particular research that was taking place and i think an important note on the third party auction was that the National Marine Fishery Service or the council don't have any authority in regards to the third party auction. So that was happening independently. The rules and sort of the regulations and how that was all conducted was being done independently because we don't have a mechanism to sort of oversee that third party auction process. And so who participated was primarily in the beginning was really commercial vessels. But by the end of the program for higher vessels were participating primarily through this third party auction process and both state and federally permitted vessels were participating. I just want to step through this. I think Bob had showed this to you at our last uh, when you all met back in May. But I think this is really important for folks to understand who who had what roles. This is really a collaborative effort in order for the RSA program to operate. So the council has very specific areas that they deal with, and it's really you know the program creation and how it's going to operate, setting aside those quota specifications. They're also involved in what the research priorities should be and reviewing proposals. NOAA Fisheries through GARFO and the um, Northeast Fisheries Science Center, they're really overseeing the program administration, right? And all the stuff from the science side, from the permitting side, 
They are providing technical support. They are actually the ones selecting the projects at the end of it that actually are going to get funded and be implemented. Um, they provide all of the, the results. So they're sort of the oversight folks. And then the states uh, and the commission, sort of everything that's happening you know, on land as those vessels that are participating are bringing on those, bringing home those RSA landed fish. So all of the dockside enforcement that needs to take place, any of the state specific permitting that needs to take place. There's a lot of quota monitoring that's going on because there, there are mixed trips. So if someone's going out and landing summer flounder, some of the summer flounder may be going towards the state specific quota. Some of those landings are going to RSA. So the states need to keep track of where the RSA landings are going. So there's a lot of work from a lot of the different entities in order to make this pro program happen. And so throughout the course of the program from 2022 to 2024, we on average funded two to five projects a year. We generated anywhere from a million to $2 million. Um, so over the course of the project, over, over the program, 39 projects were funded covering $16 million. And so the bar diagram down there at the bottom is actually all of the RSA programs that are in place. So New England has three different RSA programs for herring, monkfish, and scallops. And that's the blue line, that's the scallop RSA, which is really the sort of the gold standard for how the RSA program is operated. And the green bar is what the Mid-Atlantic Council revenues were generating on an annual basis. And so it did produce um, some quality research, some stuff that was really in informative, particularly when it comes to, to gear related issues, looking at vent sizes and vent shapes to, to support the pro appropriate escapement for scup and black sea bass. The RSA program really funded the NEMAP program as it was just getting started. So I don't know if we would have a NEMAP program that we have today without the RSA program supporting that when it was first getting started. So it was really important to NEMAP. Um, so there were some examples of where the research that came out of it was really helpful to management and to the science that we're interested in collecting. You know, but when you're looking at the species that are available for the RSA program, not all species have the same value. And I mean value in a few different ways, right? Both in the actual price, some species are worth a lot more at the dock than other species. And not all species have the same incentives. If a fishery, um, if the quotas are never met or trip limits aren't binding or there aren't closed seasons, well, there's a lot fewer incentives in place for some of our species than you have for some of our other ones, right? So someone's not going to buy um, a particular species if there's no advantage uh, being given, you know, to go out and fish, you know, you know, to have a higher possession limit or the ability to fish in a closed season. But all of our species need research, right? Even the ones that are only worth a few cents at the dock, we're still managing them and they have research needs. So how do we take advantage of those species that are bringing in money, but and still support those, uh, the research needs of species that um, aren't generating a lot of funds. And so the old RSA program did allocate uh, some things that 75% of the funds that were raised for a particular species, so for summer flounder, for example, was supposed to be targeted on summer flounder research, and 25% of those funds could be used for other species. There were exemptions for multi-species research like NEMAP, right? That's collecting information on all of our different fisheries, and so there wasn't some of these making sure the allocations were, were split 75-25. But it's also worth noting, right, that the value of our fisheries change over time. As quotas change, the values may change, as incentives change over time. So what might be valuable today may not be as valuable in the future or, or something that was more, you know, that was less valuable in the past may be more valuable in the future. So trying to keep track of where the value in our fisheries are is going to be challenging given how things, you know, change over time. So I said, there are, were a number of strengths. You know, it did allow for, you know, high priority research to be done that didn't require any federal dollars in order for that to happen. Um, it allowed managers to participate in deciding what those research priorities were. Again, you know, this goal of really trying to get fishermen and, and 
researchers together and working collaboratively so that folks trust the science that's going into it, you know, and allow for, you know, us to figure out some of the issues that we have with our, with our fisheries. However, as Bob had men mentioned, we had a number of issues with the program, and I'm not going to go into all of these, but certainly there were administrative enforcement costs that when the program was first developed, we never, by the end of the program and how things had changed, never envisioned how much those costs were actually going to be, particularly at the state level. And so maybe those costs began to outweigh the benefits that we are actually receiving. There were a number of different enforcement incentives. We, there were hundreds of dealer reports that were falsified um, and, and uh, VTRs that were falsified, accounting for hundreds of thousands of underreported summer flounder, which may have led to issues within our stock assessment. That's why National Standard 1 is, is there. So that was certainly the most egregious issue, but there were other areas. And like I said, we allowed for higher vessels to begin to participate in the RSA program. Well, there is no way to verify what those recreational vessels are landing because they're not sending any of that information to a, to a dealer. So how do we account for landings that are taking taking place on the for hire vessels. We are getting more and more vessels participating. I said in 2014 there, 103 vessels were in the program that accounted for more than 2,000 trips. That's a lot of enforcement if you were to try to monitor all of those trips individually. And the research, uh, there were a number of research um, outcomes that failed peer review, and I think there was some frustration amongst um, principal investigators. And so while NEMAP was really important to fund um, and people were behind that, the NEMAP program utilized almost all of the funds that were available. And so there was little funding for other researchers. And so I think some researchers felt, um, you know, well, what's the point of the program? I, you know, I'm not going to get any funds because all the money's going to go to the NEMAP program. And so I think folks were also beginning to get a little bit disenfranchised by, by the program that was actually in place and the research that was getting funded. So that, as Bob had mentioned, led to the suspension of the program in 2015. So the council really started to think about the RSA program again in 2019, 2020. Um, we still have research needs, right? We still have a lot of priorities. We still need funds to cover many of those needs. And so the council started with a series of exploration workshops in 2021 and 2022, really digging into what were the issues under the old program. And so we focused on some of these, these broader themes of research, funding, law enforcement, monitoring and administration. And so, out of all of those workshops were sort of recommendations or best practices and, and a lot of ideas came out of that and sort of that's what the last workshop was was to sort of synthesize all of the information we got from those first three workshops and see if we could come up with some initial recommendations that could go to the research steering committee who oversaw the development of these workshops and held at the same time a series of their own meetings to really dive into these issues and the recommendations that were coming out of the workshops. We also pulled in our SSC and we had an SSC economic work group that was really engaged in all of these workshops and all of our research steering committees to really dive into the issues. They provide us a lot of science advice in regards to some of the trade-offs we might be what, you know, thinking about in regards to the program um, and some of the economic considerations we wanna work through. So the research steering committee took all of this and tried to come up with a potentially revised program that might address all of these issues that the old program suffered from. And I'm not going to spend any time sort of going through this, but the committee did come up with um, a series of four goals and under each goal came up with a number of objectives to meet those goals. And again, focusing on some of these larger issues, right? So first one deals with goal one deals with research. That's being the most important thing. We're trying to get research out of our RSA program and that should still be our focus. But goal two and goal three get at some of those other issues that we saw under the old program, dealing with enforcement and administration and funding. And then goal four gets back to that. How do we build collaboration and trust between scientists and our fishing communities? But these goals sort of, um, you can't maximize all of these things, right? You can't maximize um, funding for research. Um, 
while at the same time maximizing the amount of participants you want in the program because that's going to really you know increase your administrative and enforcement costs so there's a lot of trade-offs speech behind like what's the right amount of funding that you need but allows you to act you know appropriately enforce and monitor the program and deal with those things and so you can't just let everybody in the program to try to maximize funds because then you'll never be able to enforce the program again so it's really trying to understand what those trade-offs might be and where the right amount um, is within each of these goals again i don't plan to go into these all of these i'm just trying to give you a sense that the workshops and the steering committee really tried to dive into all of the particular issues that the first program suffered from. So we spent a lot of time on, on each of these. This is just a list of some of the areas that we sort of dove into and tried to come up with recommendations for the council to consider. And I'll just touch upon, these are some specifics, uh, proposed changes under those different topics that I just showed on the previous slide. So there's a lot of additional under administrative enforcement, a lot of additional um, notification requirements, pre-trip and pre-landing notifications, and maybe the potential to limit where um, those offloadings occurred and at what time those offloadings occurred, not mixing trips, maybe vessels that are participating need to be um, need to have some sort of monitoring system on their vessel, either VMS or AIS. We talked about a lot about where the states fit into all of these different components. And one of those under the administration was allowing states maybe to opt in or opt out of participating in the program, similar to, although slightly different to the way we have things under the Black Sea Bass Wave 1 fishery where folks opt in to participate. And so maybe there's opportunities there for states to view or weigh in whether or not they want to actually commit the resources to participating. And so why all of this, why presenting to, to you, like, like I've said, and hopefully made clear, and as Bob had said, any potential future program is really going to require both the commission and state support and cooperation in order for any of this to, to take place. Um, we called out, and I think there was in the background materials, the summary tables, I tried to call out um, all of those areas where either decisions would be made to the states or areas where it's gonna require a lot of different state investment. So I said this opt-in or opt-out provision, whether or not states want to limit the number of vessels and the types of vessels that are gonna participate in the program. Do they wanna limit where offloading could take place? Do states want to put observers on these recreational, on these for hire um, vessels to make sure we're appropriately tracking harvest that comes off of those vessels? Using the commission's law enforcement committee to help develop um, best practices and standards across all of the different states in terms of how we're monitoring and dealing with it. And, and so obviously there's a lot of state engagement and involvement there. You know, it would likely require, if we were to move forward, a joint management action, either through a framework and an, and a, and an addendum or, you know, or an amendment process. It depends on how detailed and how many changes we would actually make to the program to determine if it would need, need an addenda or an addendum or an amendment, I mean. Um, so all of those things still need to take place depending upon where we go with the program. And I am almost done. I think this is my last slide. And so where is the council? And so I presented this all, this all happened last June, June of 2022. This was all presented to the council. And actually shortly after that meeting, I actually talked to Bob and the Gulf Council in regards to where we are. So we, we, haven't, we haven't done a whole lot since June of 2022. And so during that meeting, the council supported the, the continued redevelopment of the RSA program but also recognize that there's a lot of work that still needs to happen. There are still a lot of unresolved issues before they were to make any final decision. And so we've already identified a number of the critical issues that we still need to work through. There are a lot of specifics that we need to, to talk through, but all of that uh, is gonna take a lot of time and it's gonna take a lot of resources, not only from the council, but also the commission, the states, from National Marine Fishery Service, right? This is something now that GARFO, although they did in the past, they haven't been implementing a, a pro, an RSA program in the Mid-Atlantic, so that's gonna require commitments. And so there's a lot of things that 
both in the short term to figure out if and how a new program would be run, and then going forward. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of work to keep the RSA program going and operating into the future. And so there are sort of these long and short term cost and resource commitments um, that we want to make sure that we are all on board with before we continue to go down this road, just given the amount of, of resources it takes to get this program going. I think I said, yeah, that's my last slide. Happy to take any questions and uh, and I am looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Brandon. Appreciate that. Very comprehensive overview of a of a uh, complicated subject. But uh, at this point, I want to open it up to board members uh, for questions for Brandon, um, the opportunity to maybe dive a little deeper into some of the content of these slides. So uh, just raise your hand and then um, between Tony and I, we'll try to keep things flowing along here. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And then when we're done with questions, I have a couple of slides for the board to consider as we um, make a recommendation to the council. All right. Uh, and I'm not seeing any hands yet. Okay. I have one hand. Emerson, you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, actually, with the chair's permission, I have two very quick questions. Go, go right ahead, Emerson. Thank you. Um, so, um, Brandon, I just wanted to verify that back in 2014, um, the program was suspended, not eliminated. Is that correct? Yeah, thanks, Emerson. If I if I had indicated that or said that, that was a mistake. It was just suspended. It, it, the program is still in our regulations. It's still there. It still exists. It hasn't been removed from from our ability to implement it. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to verify that. Um, and then the second question is, um, you mentioned in, in 2022, the Mid-Atlantic Council voted to continue the process to explore the redevelopment of RSA. And if I recall, that was a unanimous vote, wasn't it? I would have to go back and double check to verify Emerson, but I believe so. I believe it was a unanimous vote. Uh, thank you, Brandon. And uh, Mr. Chair, I know you're not ready yet, but when you are ready, um, I do have a, uh, um, a motion to offer to the board. Thank you. All right, thank you, Emerson. Uh, any other hands up, Tony? Uh, we have Lynn Bagley followed up by John Clark. All right, go ahead, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a, a lot of questions, but I guess if, if I may um, ask two quick ones. I, I'm sort of curious because certainly a concern from our end um, is the administrative end of this. I mean, we in Maryland, we just simply don't have the bandwidth um, to add another layer onto, onto quota monitoring. So I, my question was, I actually maybe wanted to hear from a state who, uh, you know, maybe with the scallop or the monkfish fishery and just hear a little bit about what sort of effort that, that they need to put in. And then the other um, question I had was if the, if the work groups at all had any ideas to disentangle the value of the fish from the amount of money that's generated for research because it seems like you know as brandon pointed out different species are worth very different amounts but all research is expensive so if you fish a cheap fish that pi you know if he's um or she is trying to sell quota to a you know, a, a 10 cent per pound fishery, they're, they're not, they're gonna have a much harder time achieving the same level of research than maybe the scallop fishery would. And it seems like it would be in a, in a perfect utopic world, the amount of money that's generated for the RSA would be consistent among the critters. And I just wondered if, the, if there were any ideas on how to separate those two. Go ahead, Brandon. If you've got an answer. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to, I mean, so Lynn, I can't speak to actually how scallops or monkfish work, but it is, 
but I but I will just will point out, and it was one of the slides that I had put in for the Golf Council. Like scallops operates right quite differently than summer flounder, for example. It, you know, it's it's all federally managed. It primarily takes place in federal waters. It's primarily from one specific gear type. Um, I'm not saying it's easy. There's a lot of work that goes into the scallop RSA and it's worth a lot of money, which also makes it um, you know, more advantageous to support research, but versus you know, where you are dealing with summer flounder where we have you know, fishing that's taking place in state and federal waters, um, you have different types of vessels that are participating, different gear types that are participating. It's it's can be a lot more complex to sort of deal with within a particular state. And just speaking from my own, ex, you know, old experience when I was in New Jersey and issuing the permits under the RSA program, just tracking the number of vessels that are participating because quota can get transferred from vessel to vessel throughout the year and knowing what how much quota is on a particular vessel for what particular species, it's, it's you know, it can be, quite um, time consuming and obviously all the enforcement that goes into making sure that those things work out. And like I said, and the quota monitoring piece of it, because under the old program, you could land a mixed bag of summer flounder or black sea bass. Some of those would be going to your state specific quota. Some of those would be going to the RSA and making sure that RSA landings weren't getting counted against your state quota. Now, one of the resolutions or one of the options that the research steering committee talked about was not allowing for that anymore, that if you were going to go out and use black sea bass RSA, now you could still land other species if you had the appropriate permits for them, but any, if you were going out on an RSA trip for black sea bass, all of your black sea bass that you'd be bringing in all had to get counted against your RSA. It couldn't get some of it towards the state quota, some of it, no more of that because that makes things a lot more challenging to sort of monitor and keep track of. And in regards to the different fishing values, yeah, I mean, that's the hard part. Like you said, I mean, dogfish, right, isn't worth a whole lot back at the dock or even bluefish, you know, you know we could get some reasonable amounts of money raised for bluefish. But it is, you saw that, you know, bar, um, bar graph, almost all of the money generated is through summer flounder and black sea dust. That's where the value is. That's where the incentives are, right? Because we are fully utilizing those two fisheries. And so people are willing to pay to take advantages under those two particular species. But recognizing that, um, all of our species have needs and some of them are never going to generate the amount of money needed for research. Um, but like the scallop program, the scallop RSA only funds research on scallops. The monkfish RSA only funds re research for monkfish. Where here in the mid-Atlantic, we've utilized that where recognizing that our species are a little different, we've utilized those funds to, to support research for other species. Follow up with Brandon on that. Doesn't right. look like Lynn had follow up. And then John Clark was next. Okay, go ahead, John. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Brandon. Uh, my interest was similar to what Lynn asked. Just curious as to from that experience, RSA just really seems to work best on high value fisheries. And how does that help offset? Uh, Obviously, the administrative costs are going to be similar across species, or does it vary by species? It seems like with scallops, as you were saying, since it's a very directed offshore fishery, maybe that gets folded into the administrative costs easier than it would for some of these lower value fisheries that are pursued more widely, as we have here in the mid Atlantic. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I. Yeah, go ahead, Brand. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I'm, it's tough for me to speak about the, the scallop one. And I will also say about scallops, if you recall, um, we had those two, we have in the Mid-Atlantic, those two different funding mechanisms that we've generally used, right? This, uh, the auction and those bilateral agreements where the researchers and industry are working together. 
that partnership, that's primarily, from my understanding, how things operate on the Scallop uh, RSA is where those researchers and the industry are working collaboratively. And so the setup is is quite quite different, you know, even just in terms of how things are operated and how the funds are are generated for for the research there. So I, you know, I don't know if anybody from Garfo has additional information in regards to like how the administration of that operates differently and, and what the associated costs are, but the programs, just given the value, given how our fisheries operate um, in the Mid-Atlantic are just are just very different than scallops. And so it doesn't lend itself to all of the sort of smoothness that uh, scallops may provide. All right, thanks, Brandon. Any, uh, any other hands up, Tony? Questions? Uh, Mr. Chair Ryan Silva, who manages the or has managed the RSA program uh, in the Garfo office of NOAA, has his hand up. All right, go ahead, Ryan. Ryan, you should be able to unmute now. There you go. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, Ryan Silva, Garfo. I do uh, still manage the research set aside programs. And just to add a little bit more detail to Brandon's. Um, explanation, you know, the I think he he captured it in that when the Mid Atlantic program was functioning, uh, I think it, the the administrative burden derived largely from the amount of vessel activity, um, the number of vessels involved, and the in the interaction between the federal and state regulations. Um, you know, with the skull fishery and the monkfish fishery, the we monitor. That, uh, the harvest of set aside, so the the reporting requirements are largely the same between programs. Um, you know, notification before they leave, before they come back, what was harvested, um, other information that allows us to correlate the vessel reports with other data sources like VTR and dealer data. Um, it's just the volume of trips is much lower in the scale of RSA program, um, and then you know the the regulations that those vessels are exempted from are also fewer. So I think it's just the nature of the multiple fisheries, the, the, the interface with the, the state regulations and the number of vessels involved. Thanks, thanks Ryan. Um, any other hands up for questions, Tony? I do not have any other hands. I've got, I've got one for you, Brandon. So back when the program was operational and uh, when circumstances arose and people had obviously violated, I guess, the terms and conditions of the program and I guess possibly applicable state laws. I mean, what were, what were the consequences to those individuals that, that did that? Yeah, so that's a good good question, Spud. So the those large violations, the ones that I've talked about in regards to summer flounder, those were those were out of New York, and those those individuals, dealers and fishermen, were prosecuted. Um, I don't remember exactly what the fines were, but they were pretty substantial, and and loss of licenses and and those things. Um, so. It can be pretty substantial. Some of them though, again, this was one of the points that I had made, right? So each state has a different type of um, what you would call an exempted fishing permit. In order to have these vessels above, you know, land above the, your state specific possession limit or outside of a season, the states generally need to issue a permit in order for those vessels to come in and, and offload in your particular state. And it's quite varying in regards to what the authority is on those different permits and what you can actually do. In New Jersey, it's not very much. Um, you could just remove them from, from that permit, but it really wouldn't carry much else. Um, and so there are, those are things where, you know, getting feedback from the law enforcement committee, make sure some of these additional permits have the teeth to carry substantial penalties if someone is violating. Certainly there's there's opportunities under the federal exempted fishing permit to do that, but some of the state permits are quite varied that allow vessels to do this and making sure that those have some weight 
to penalize vessels that break the RSA rules is really going to be important. Thanks. Thanks, Brandon. All right, last call for questions for Brandon. Uh, yep. If there's not any, then I'll turn it back to you, Tony. And Thanks, you and Bob for questions for the questions back to the board. Yep, we have one more hand raised, and that's Jim Gilmore. All right, go ahead, Jim. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And just to follow up on uh, a little more detail on Brendan's last statement um, and the the uh, deterrent in terms of the uh, what the fines were, um, the most egregious in New York, um, it was. Uh, um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was in uh, the penalty was in you know major dollars, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not even up to a million, I think. Um, there was also um, the uh, individual lost every permit. Um, he had to close his business, was out of the business, and went to federal prison and a maximum security one for four months. So um, you know, as bad as it was, the the penalties that the individual got were substantial and. Hopefully that would be enough of a deterrent that if we go back into this program, it, there's serious consequences if somebody uh, doesn't play by the rules. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Uh, all right, Tony, I'll uh, I'll turn it back to you and Bob for uh, questions back to the board. Thank you. I mean, just uh, show my screen here. Hopefully you guys are seeing these questions. If you're not, speak up, otherwise I'll go forward. So I think for the rest of the day today, we're going to, or of this call, the time we have allotted, um, have a couple of questions for the board and you know, trying to determine whether or not the commission wants to recommend to the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council if the RSA program continues or not. And you know, a very important question in that portion of the recommendation is, do the states have the administrative capacity to carry out and enforce the program? If the states do not have that administrative capacity, as Brandon um, highlighted, is that this cooperation between the states and NOAA fisheries in carrying out this program is essential. Um, if we do have that capacity in the um, commission does want to make a recommendation to move forward with the program. Um, do we want to have some specifics in our recommendation and some things just to think about and consider? Brandon went over um, a bunch of different uh, thoughts that the research steering committee discussed, but a couple of highlights is should the program include both the commercial and the four higher sectors or only just one of those sectors in, in moving forward? Um, should the program be limited to spe a specific species or a series of species? If so, which ones? Should the program be limited to specific ports and or dealers? And should a state be able to opt in or out of the program? So meaning, can a state not allow um, RSA quota to be landed in their state? And those are the, the questions that I had for the board to think about, Mr. Chair. All right, thanks, Tony. And I know Emerson, you have a, a motion sort of pursuant to this first question. Before we get there, though, I'd like to just open it up for uh, feedback from uh, state folks uh, uh, to this question, and and you know, the, sort of the big question here of you know, are the states that would bear the burden of making this program successful? Uh, do they have the capacity to do it? And so I'll just open up the floor uh, for some feedback. Uh, on this first question and then you know depending on where we go with that and any subsequent motions we'll perhaps dive a little deeper into those other questions so with that i'll just open the floor up okay i have dan mckiernan bill hyatt jason mcamee thank you tony <clears throat> thank you mr chairman so from my perspective massachusetts does not have the resources to carry out a mid-Atlantic RSA program as was um, designed um, in the past. And um, I would like, I have a motion as well, and I suggest that it should be um, specific to the federally managed species, those that are exclusively managed that the Mid-Atlantic Council oversees. When in fact, we 
had made, uh, she, she asked the question about, <clears throat> you know, how do these other successful RSA programs run by New England, you know, what's the state burden in, the, in that setting? It's zero. The, those, those programs don't require uh, my state of Massachusetts to do anything for the scholar uh, set aside, for the herring set aside, although we do, uh, we have been beneficiaries of that. We've worked with some of the, the vessels, but it doesn't require us to um, exert any enforcement or compliance or monitoring. So I'll just stop there, uh, but I have a whole lot of other points I'd like to make, but that's my first point I'd like to make at this time. All right, thank you, Dan. All right, uh, Bill Hyatt, and then I'll go to Jay Matt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is just a question that I probably should have asked uh, a few moments ago. But if if a state has the if it proceeds such that the state has the option of opting out, um, is it safe safe to say that their quota, their allocation, would not be affected, uh, or, or is it uh, assumed that the the cut for the RSA would come off the top, and that the states would would have a, a diminishment in quota or allocation? Um, anyways, and I asked that primarily because I was not involved at all in, in any of the preceding program and um, just uh, just wondering how it's envisioned that would unfold. Um, Brandon, I'll let you uh, respond to that if you if you can. Yeah, thank, thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Bill. I, I mean, the way it has operated in the past, and I think the Research Steering Committee didn't had some suggestions for how we would maybe do things a little bit differently, but the RSA quota would essentially, it comes off the top, right? So if you were, if the council and the board agreed to take 3% of the ABC for, um, and maybe it's not the ABC, I don't remember exactly where it gets deducted, but it gets deducted before it gets sent to all of the different states if there are state specific quotas. So if you take 3% of summer flounder off, everybody's you know allocation essentially is going down because you're you're taking that off the top before it gets allocated down does, does that make sense bill yeah thank you it basically tells me it's not just taken from those who opt into the program if if they have that option thank you that's correct yep all right thanks bill all right go ahead jay thank you mr chair um so I'll try not to get too far into um, the specifics. I think maybe that that's for later. But uh, you know, generally, I thought so. We had a, a lot of RSA, Mid Atlantic RSA landings in in Rhode Island um, when the program was going on, and I felt like we had a decent system. We had decent accountability, um, and, and there were things that kind of evolved back then as well like i believe safest has uh, uh you know a switch or something in it that you can hit if it's an rsa landing versus uh uh you know a regular state quota landing so you can differentiate the catch in the electronic dealer reporting um and so you know i felt like we have the capacity back then i i feel like we have the capacity now, although I do think we've learned a lot and can uh, improve the program, and we can probably get pretty close to, you know, the situation that um, Dan McKiernan was talking about, where, you know, the states don't have as much administrative burden if if these things are automated and um, to the extent possible. And you know, I think the RSC and in, in that summary document. I think they've identified a lot of the, the core areas that need to be tightened up. And so I guess I, I have more optimism uh, than some of the comments we've heard so far that we could redevelop this program. We could uh, do it in a way that doesn't have a, a huge amount of administrative burden on the states. And I think there's a lot of benefits both to the fishing industry uh, as well as the, the state, you know, that. Um, gets the landings or, or gets the the outcomes of the research or, or what have you. Um, some of the things I just wanted to mention really quick that they're kind of in some of the, the background materials, but I just want to emphasize um, one of the things that we could do is, is require any vessel participating in RSA have electronic vessel monitoring of, of some sort. Um, and so that's 
you know, a, a good technique for having really high accountability. Um, and then one other comment I'll make is the, you know, we heard comments about the idea that the research wasn't relevant or um, wasn't related to the species and things like that. And I, I agree with that. I think there was a lot of great stuff that came out of it. And Brandon mentioned NEMAP is sort of like the crowning achievement. Uh, but there's there's other good work that, that came out of um, the program. And, um, you know, I think one thing we may need to think about, and I don't remember, this may have been in the background materials, I don't remember seeing it, but to have like a, a research steering committee or, or something like that, that can um, better kind of, you know, look at a proposal and, and determine whether or not it meets the objectives of, of the program. So um, just, uh, I wanted to give a little bit more optimism uh, than some of the other folks who've commented and uh, offer those couple of specific things to the, the second slide. Um, uh, that uh, Tony talked about. So thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jay. Um, any other hands up now, Tony? We have Emerson, Hasbrook, Jim Gilmore, followed up by Dan McKiernan. All right, go ahead, Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, Jason actually mentioned um, a, a bit of what I was going to say, but also, you know, um, if if one would look at the background materials that were available for this meeting, um, the research steering committee report of the workshops um, has a range of options to reduce the administrative and enforcement burden of the states. And there are a lot of technologies that are available now that were not available previously that can help to reduce um, the administrative burden. Um, and, and, and Jason just mentioned a couple of them. Um, also, you know, what's possible is some assistance for the states from the RSA um, uh, principal investigators. You know, for instance, I had a, um, a Cornell staff member in the DEC office for a couple of years to assist them um, with that administrative burden. And that was mostly a paperwork burden because everything was paperwork then. You know, there were not... There was not EVTRs. There was not electronic dealer reporting. Um, so there's those electronic technologies and additional electronic technologies that can be brought to bear on this. Thank you. Thank you, Emerson. Uh, who was next, Tony? Was it Jim or Dan? It was Jim followed by Dan. All right, go ahead, Jim. Thanks, Chairman. Um, good. Actually, Emerson touched on it a little bit, but it's a two-part question. I, and I, 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 the first part was I, we, I, uh, I would assume that the states wouldn't be precluded in using, um, you know, some parts of revenue, whatever, to beef up the administrative parts of it. So whether they wanted to, uh, you know, use their own revenues or or part of the whatever was in the RSA program, that would still be feasible. Because Emerson was right. We had staff uh, from Cornell that was in our office. And we've already ramped up quite a bit our um, our, um, our data group, in particular vessel trip reports. So we, we've kind of increased that already. But um, the other part of it, though, is and, and Brandon, you may have covered this. Uh, maybe I missed it. But um, for the for the um, um, I forget the name of the organization that was doing. Um, um, you know, when we got to the part where they were handing it out to the individual fishermen, whatever, that helped program, um, um, I forget the, the name of it again, but what was the, uh, what was the funding behind that? Uh, there was a third party um, that was, uh, was acting as an intermediary to put that data, or put that, um, you know, the, whatever quota you were going to bid on. Uh, how did that get funded? Yeah, go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And I am completely drawing a blank now that you said it, Jim, on the name of the the organization that ran the the auction. So there were a few different ways in terms of how they were supported. In order for uh, a vessel or an individual to bid on an auction, to bid on an auction, they had to pay to be a member of this organization. This is the organization that ran the 
the auction itself. So a vessel, and I don't remember what the exact costs are. They did bring it down quite a bit uh, as more people were getting into the auction bidding process. But so that's one way uh, that funds were generated to support this third party was that you had to pay to be a part of it and you had to be a part of it in order to bid on the auction. And then they also, they took an administrative fee. So out of those fees generated from the auction, they, they and I don't remember what it was, 15% or 8% or something like that of the fees generated were used to um, support the administrative costs of running the auction. And those folks, it wasn't just running the auction. I mean, that was the major part of it, but those folks were also dealing with quota that would be getting transferred between vessels as well that had participated in the program. So there was a number of administrative, you know, issues that they were sort of dealing with as they were tracking through the program. Okay, Th thanks Brandon, that's, that's helpful. And I just got this shotgun blast. It was a National Fisheries Institute uh, from a bunch of people, so thanks. Thanks Jim. All right, uh, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on Jason's comments about this commercial landings and safest. And, and I agree with Jason, and I would applaud uh, the state of Rhode Island's, um, you know, uh, quarter monitoring system. They, they do an outstanding job. But what I'm concerned about is the old program evolved to the point where the for hire sector became the predominant um, or, or the majority holders of, of these of these qu essentially quotas, and if you think about this in modern times uh, compared to back 10 to 15 years ago, back then all those species, you know, scup, sea bass, fluke, were overfished, and the quotas were a limiting factor. <clears throat> but today we have a, a huge surplus of scup quota. Uh, we have a lot of unused fluke quota. Uh, I don't think the revenues are going to be there from the commercial sector, <clears throat> but what you're going to have because of the the sharing uh, per, the percentages that are built into the Mid-Atlantic Council's plans, <clears throat> you have a desperate need for more recreational uh, allocation. And so the the new the new systems are going to be predominantly party charter uh, purchases, <clears throat> and we cannot manage that uh, through SAFIS. They're not reporting to SAFIS. Uh, we don't have the ability to monitor uh, all the folks who, who would want to buy quota to fish out of compliance, uh, you know, with, with a slightly higher bag limit or not, or during a closed period, uh, it, it would be incompatible. And so I have uh, some, some still serious concerns. I don't, I, I just want everybody to think that through. We just can't turn back the clock and, and tweak a few uh, features. We have to think about this uh, in the modern uh, in, in, in the modern conditions of where quota is, is desired and who's going to buy these quotas if we proceed uh, with a system where auction uh, auction is uh, is the um, is the preferred or the selected method. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Tony, any other hands? I have no other hands at this time. All right. Well, I think in the interest of moving forward, I know Emerson uh, had a motion that he wanted to offer for consideration. So I think maybe that will help us focus our the remaining time we have. Uh, and I know Dan, you've got one, so we can uh, we can dive into this and and uh, see if we can move things forward. So uh, we've got a draft motion. Uh, Emerson, I'll let you read it uh, into the record and then we'll see if we can get a second. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, move that the uh, Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission ISFMP Policy Board support the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council's activities to continue the process of exploring the redevelopment of the Mid-Atlantic Research Set-Aside Program using the program framework outlined by the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council's Research Steering Committee and based on their four RSA workshops to inform a possible future management action. Such redevelopment activity should address the alternatives 
and ameliorate the concerns and problems identified by the uh, RSC in the recent RSA workshops and in the July 30, 2014 Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council staff RSA memo. Um, and I'd be happy to um, provide um, uh, my justification if I get a second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Emerson. Do we have a second? If so, uh, raise your hand and signify so. Give Jason that me. All right, so we have a motion and we have a second. So I'll I'll go back to you, Emerson, as the maker of the motion for some uh, further uh, explanation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My audio working again? Yeah, I've got you loud yeah, and clear. Okay, great, thank you. So <clears throat> the RSA program uh, was a valuable program providing funding to address research priorities for several species. Um, other funding was not adequate to address those research priorities, and in fact, it's still not adequate. Um, not only did the RSA program provide research funding, it also encouraged researchers in the fishing industry to work together in a cooperative approach. Now, admittedly, there were problems with the old RSA program, which is why it was suspended. But the Research Steering Committee um, has accomplished significant work in examining and identifying those previous problems and developing draft recommendations to address those previous problems and shortcomings. And a lot of that information um, is in the uh, meeting uh, materials that were posted for this meeting. Um, so other than having funding for fisheries research and conducting that research, a new redeveloped program will not look like the previous program. It can't and it won't. Um, so when you look at um, the slides that uh, Brandon presented, you can see that many of the problems um, that were identified, uh, uh, the problems of the previous program that were identified, and the solutions to those problems um, are addressed through the Research Steering Committee. Um, in fact, I would direct, uh, direct people's attention um, to the administrative and enforcement section that I think addresses most states' critical concerns. So specifically, um, you know, th those recommendations are related to, um, a lot of them are related to administrative and enforcement burden. And the issues um, raised in Tony's slide um, actually are addressed in, in the research steering committee information, including um, consider limiting offloading times and ports and dealers, the use of electronic technology to reduce administrative and enforcement burden. And there's, you know, there's many new technologies that are available now that were not available previously. Also, um, Research Steering Committee has recommended that states decide participation by sector and number of vessels. So if a state doesn't want to have a particular sector to um, participate or wants to limit the number of vessels, those options are currently um, in the document, the draft document that's been um, uh, developed. Um, also, um, you know, the other um, ob objectives address some of the other concerns that have been raised. So I therefore encourage the policy board to support and be involved in the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council's efforts to continue the process of exploring the redevelopment of the RSA program. This is not a final approval of implementation of the RSA program. Uh, we'll be able to weigh in on that um, in the future when the Research Steering Committee has um, completed its work. Um, and then just lastly, it's it's up to the PI to decide how they're going to turn fish into dollars. It doesn't have to go into an auction. In fact, it cannot be mandated to go into an auction, um, nor does it have to be um, individual agreements between the PI and the um, um, and, and the commercial fishing vessels involved. So that's that's up to the PI. So um, that's what I have for now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you, Emerson. Uh, Jason, as the secondary, anything you'd like to add to that? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I think uh, Emerson did a great job, um, so I won't um, offer too much more uh, than he did. You know, I again, just really briefly, I think there are a lot of benefits. I, I really appreciated Dan McKiernan's comments about, um, you know, the, the kind of recreational version of it. I, now, I'm not saying I'm, I'm opposed to the recreational version of it, but these are the, the things I feel like we have a good, we've had a, a group that spent a lot of time thinking, generating um, information, generating the lessons uh, learned from the previous version of it. And, and so I, I feel like, you know, let's put a framework together. Let's um, get a look at it before we, um, you know, rush to judgment. And I think um, we might be more comfortable when we see what that the new version of the program looks like. So I, I fully support continuing uh, the development of this because I'm, I'm really interested in seeing what that uh, more perfected program looks like. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Jason. All right. I want to open it up to the board for uh, comments, uh, either for or against. Uh, so, Tony, any hands? Yeah, Mel Bell. All right. Go ahead, Mel. Followed by Dan. Okay. Go ahead, Mel. Uh, yeah, obviously not from the mid, but I was just going to, I heard a couple people I'll point out uh, that, you know, perhaps uh, one of the things that would be considered in, in terms of kind of making a new and improved program would be uh, perhaps reliance on some other different degree of law enforcement involvement uh, related to offloadings and timing and uh, perhaps offloading places and um, and use of EMS. And I would just just from experience, so we had a have a fishery. Uh, you know, in the South Atlantic, it's a uh, wreckfish, which uh, some of that exists. And it, it is a little more complex than it sounds, perhaps. And it, it even kind of uh, results in um, the need to bring the states in terms of law enforcement capabilities into managing something like that. So I would, I'm uh, certainly not in opposition to, uh, you know, if folks want to further explore this and look at it. Uh, uh, in the mid, that, that's fine, makes sense. I would just encourage uh, that it definitely involve law enforcement in the discussions of, uh, of uh, how you might wire this thing in terms of uh, if you want to have some of those additional uh, capabilities uh, in exploring offloading and timing and VMS and that sort of thing, because uh, it, it it isn't perhaps as easy as it sounds, and and we just experienced that from you know one simple fishery, uh, a very small fishery actually in the in the South uh, Atlantic. So I just encourage uh, uh, to definitely stay keep law enforcement in the discussions on this from the very beginning. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Mel. All right, Dan, back to you. Yeah. Um... I'm opposed to this motion, and if uh, at some point I'd like to make a substitute to only go with those species that are managed in the New England style, which is um, where the states don't co-manage those species, <clears throat> which would include, you know, the ocean cohogs, the 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 squids, et cetera. But just a few rhetorical questions. I don't think it's lawful to exclude, or maybe it is, the, the for hire sector from buying some of this quota. And I think that's probably why we wound up accommodating all the for hire interests because of you know issues of fairness. But I guarantee you that's what undermined this program. And I, I think that's just gonna create a an unenforceable um, uh, and unmanageable end product. Uh, in my view, this is gonna go down the path of IFQs for the recreational fishery. Um, as far as Massachusetts goes, um, we have 84 co uh, offices, half of them are assigned to the coast, and that's th that 84 number is down from a high of about 140. So I don't necessarily have a lot of enforcement resources in Massachusetts that, uh, that, I, that, that can be diverted to this, uh, this uh, new program. Um, and, I, and finally, as long as we keep looking back to RSA, 
because it, it worked once. And I understand the folks at Rutgers and the folks at Cornell were you know, really uh, enjoyed those benefits. But as long as we keep looking to this flawed program, we're never going to do what needs to be done, which is, which is to go get less complicated funding sources, whether it be an expanded SK program or or another congressional appropriation. 20 years ago, there was something called the Northeast Consortium and, and the, the New Hampshire congressman shoveled tons of money to do cooperative research. So there are other avenues or other means to get funding for cooperative research. And I don't want to be perceived as, as not wanting to, to uh, encourage cooperative research and to develop great working relationships with, with, the, with, the, uh, with the stakeholders. I just think this thing is just so, terribly complicated. And so having said that, um, I would like to make the substitute motion, which is, um, I don't know if this is the time, Mr. Chairman, but it would be to um, to go with this alternative um, for only those species that not jointly manage with the, with the commission and that, that is the states. So I just think that uh, the burden is too great on the states um, to pull this off. All right, Dan, we'll go ahead and read that motion uh, in to the record. Uh, Thank we'll you. Forget a second. Motion to substitute to recommend to the Maine Atlantic Council to consider future RSA programs only for those species not jointly managed with the ASMFC. This would preclude RSA programs being conducted for summer flounder, black sea bass, scup, dogfish, and bluefish. All right. Thank you. We've got a motion. Do we have a second? If so, uh, raise your hand and signify so. Uh, John Clark. We'll All right, we have a second by John Clark. Okay, so we have a we have a substitute motion now before the board. Um, so I will open up. Uh, thank Dan, you've sort of gone ahead and laid the groundwork for the rationale behind this. But I'll, uh, John, I'll give you a opportunity as a seconder to to speak to the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think Dan has made all the points. I uh, I agree with what Dan said and his reasons for making the motion. Thank you. All right. And at this point, I'll open it up to the board uh, for discussion on this substitute motion. So just raise your hand, and I'll I'll call on you. Uh, no first hand, I, first hand, I have Erica, Cherie, and Dan. Your hand is still up. I'm not sure if you want to speak again or not. You all right, you put it down. So Erica followed by Cherie, and then um, lastly Lynn. All right, go ahead, Erica. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate Dan's comments and his making of this motion. Um, given that Florida only had one species that could potentially be impacted by this, I felt uncomfortable voicing strong opposition to the interest of the Mid-Atlantic Council to explore options for their fisheries. Um, but because bluefish would be removed from the discussion, I'm supportive of this motion. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, Cherie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I support uh, this motion also. I think that there's just a lot of um, effort involved in RSA programs when it comes to including, including the states in um, any sort of uh, federal fisheries and I've seen it happen with um, success happen in, at the New England Fisheries Management Council level with scallops. So I know that there are successes to this, but I also know that we had um, an RSA program for the Northern Shrimp, and that was very, very labor intensive and not sure that that uh, really benefited um, any sort of research that uh, came out of that. So I am in support of this motion. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Sheree. All right. Uh, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I had trouble getting to my microphone. Um, yes, I support this substitute motion. I think it um, really sort of threads the needle and lets some of this work um, proceed and grow and provides us an opportunity to learn from what's happening on the federal end. And, and you know, as a state, I have I have so many concerns about this. And, and to Dan's point, I almost think that we may have some problems of authority 
and legality as well. If we have, um, you know, principal investigators for projects who are singling out vessels that may, um, you know, uh, have a financial advantage, you know, in Maryland, we we can't really run programs that offer financial advantages to to stakeholders, to commercial fishermen or recreational fishermen without creating some sort of, you know, everybody has to sort of be able to apply under the same criteria. So I worry that it would sort of open up a ball of a ball of um, can of worms, the can of worms here. So I support the motion. Thank you. Yeah, I think a ball of worms is worse than a can of worms. But yeah. Uh, uh, all right, Tony, any uh, other hands raised? Um, I have Emerson, Jim Gilmore, Joe Semino, Pat Kelleher, and then Ryan Silva. I guess I'll, Ryan put his hand up as Lynn spoke. I guess, I don't know if you would indulge him if he sure. had a, to raise yeah. a point to, if Ryan, if you're just commenting generally, we'll keep you in line, but if you were responding to a point Lynn made, then maybe go ahead. Um, thank you. No, I, it was more relative to the motion and the implications for funding and what the program might support um, under this scenario. Right, so, so I'm happy to speak in an hour wait. Let's put you in. Well, it's up to the chair, so I'll leave it to Jim. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you what, while, while we've got you queued up, just, just go ahead. And that way it might actually help inform the further discussion. So go ahead, Ryan. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just relative to Brandon's presentation that he provided earlier, you know, I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, the, the, the primary goal of the program um, is to support uh, research uh, to help with the councils and commissions uh, management programs. And those prior research projects were almost entirely funded through Summer Flounder, Black Sea Bass, and Scott. And I think we would have some concern uh, from the fishery service about trying to redevelop a program where it's not clear that there's viable funding um, in order to support the research. So something I think that uh, would give us pause with this motion. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna go back to my list and uh, let's see, we've got Emerson and then it'll be Jim Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, obviously, I'm opposed to this um, substitute motion. I think we should give, um, the Mid-Atlantic Council and its Research Steering Committee, the ability to um, continue the process of exploring the redevelopment of the RSA program, um, give them the opportunity to address the problems that have been identified by the Research Steering Committee that have been identified back in 2014 by Mid-Atlantic Council staff that have been identified today um, um, by my fellow commissioners. Let's give them the opportunity to do that and let's see what comes out the other end. As I said before, this is not a final vote on, on re-implementing the RSA program. This is just a vote um, to provide support to the council uh, to further develop the options. Let's not, let's, <laughs> essentially, let's not kill it now. Let's give the research steering committee um, the opportunity to go through this process and see what comes out the other end and choose what we like and, and maybe not choose what we don't like. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Jim Gilmore, then I'll go to Joe Semino. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, you know, along the lines that Emerson had just said, the I, I, I think this is premature. Um, the whole concept of this was to look at it again and now we're essentially taking off some of the uh, more valuable species off of this that would actually probably help the program work. So um, at some point, if we find out that, you know, maybe it, it is too complicated that we would, you know, maybe entertain such a motion. But at this point, uh, I just think it's premature or prejudging things before we have really looked into it. Remember, the RSA program got suspended almost 10 years ago, and it was using technology that was done, you know, 15 years or more before that. Um, as Emerson had said before, we've got a lot more tools now um, and a lot more monitoring capability than we had back then. So uh, the new RSA program, I think, is going to be uh, a lot, well, it's going to be difficult, but there's still there's a lot more tools that we'll be able to track and monitor it. 
Um, so again, I, I'm opposed to the motion because I just think it's premature at this point. We really need to flesh this out before we start you know, taking chunks of fisheries out of it. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right, Joe, and then I'll go to Pat Kelleher. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And somehow it seems like we might be doing a little pro and con here. Um, because I, 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 I sympathize with where Emerson and, and Jim are, uh, but given the species that we're talking about that are jointly managed, even though I think dogfish might be a great candidate and maybe someday bluefish, you know, those stocks are, are not in a place where we're going to be looking at really additional quota as being on the table. And then I very much share Dan's concerns <clears throat> with flounder scup and sea bass and the four higher fleets. You know, there's 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 no time limit set on this recommendation for only dealing with these species. And I think that this motion by Dan has a a better chance of passing instead of nothing happening again. So I'm supportive of the motion and I think at some point in time we can reconsider as Lynn mentioned, maybe we can learn from some of uh, this as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. All right, uh, Pat Kelleher. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I was going to stay completely out of this conversation. Obviously, we don't have a, a dog in this fight. However, as the conversation has um, unfolded and uh, after hearing about the concerns from an administrative standpoint and a law enforcement standpoint, um, I do garner a little bit of sympathy for for the states that are in that position. We've certainly run into that in Maine with the Herring RSA, um, where the PI was not communicating with the state, and then vessels were landing in Maine outside of the the days at sea that were um, established through um, uh, through the Herring Committee. So um, those things do exist. There are burdens to the states, and to me. Um, Dan is, um, to use Lynn's um, term, has threaded the needle here a little bit, and so um, I would su I would support this motion to substitute. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. All right, Tony, uh, update my list of hands. It's empty. It's empty. Okay. <laughs> All right. Ah, uh, okay. We've had some some good back and forth discussion on this. Um, I think it's time to call the question to deal with the substitute motion. I know it's kind of hard to do this caucusing in a virtual world but uh, we had to do it for a couple of years so i'm just going to pause uh for a minute or two in case folks need to to caucus uh via text or whatever and then uh we'll come back and have a vote tony do we how are we going to do this vote uh just call out the states i'll do it just like i do board meetings where I'll, or if you just ask for the yeses and i'll say the state names out loud okay Sounds good. All right, I'll uh, give everybody a couple of minutes to, for any caucus needs. I start at a clock. I'll let you know when two minutes is up. Is that All something? right, very good. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I think we are ready to call the question or ask the question. All right, thank you, Tony. So all uh, those policy board members in favor of the substitute motion signify by raising your hand and then Tony will name all the states represented. I'm just gonna give the hands a second to settle. I have Connecticut, South Carolina, Delaware, Georgia, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Maryland, New Jersey, Florida, and Maine. I will put, if I missed anyone, speak up. Otherwise, I'll put your hands down for you. All right. Are you ready for the the no's? I am. All right. Uh, those uh, opposed to the substitute motion signify by raising your hand. I have Virginia, Rhode Island, New York, North Carolina, and Potomac River Fisheries Commission. All right. Is there any abstentions? I had to put the hands down. Now for the abstentions, if you oh, could raise your hand. Right. Sorry about that. Ryan, I'm assuming you're voting for Noah here. I did not. Oh, that's right. Thanks, Tony. Right. Yep. I just want to double check. So one abstention, Noah Fisheries. All right. And uh, no votes. Any no votes uh, signify by raising your hand. 
I have no hands. All right, so no null votes. So according to my count, that's 11 yeses and five noes. And what abstention, is that correct? That is what I have as well, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you very much. So the substitute motion now becomes the main motion. Correct. All Give right. Me a second here, I will get that up. All right. There you go. Okay. Uh, before we call for votes on what is now the main motion, I want to just uh, forward one last opportunity for any questions. Because <clears throat> I think, again, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly take the opportunity to make it clear that what we're doing is providing advice by Mid Atlantic Council. And it is my understanding, and, you know, Brandon, Tony, Bob, whoever, correct me, that we're providing this advice to the Mid-Atlantic Council, but this motion in and of itself is not limiting or binding on the Mid-Atlantic Council, other than the fact that if they realize that the, the states that would be required to participate in RSAs on certain species are not likely to do it, I guess that certainly would change the nature of the discussion, as Ryan had already commented on. So. Anyway, are there any any questions um, about the intent uh, and the effect of this motion before we vote on it? Any hands, Tony? I do not see any hands, Mr. Chair. Uh, any discussion on this motion before we vote? I have no hands. All right. At that point, we'll uh, we'll conduct the vote on what is now the main motion. So, all those in favor of the Motion, um, does this need to be read back into the record, Tony? I believe, yes, it would be helpful. All right, I'll read it if, if that's okay. Um, we have a motion to recommend to the Mid-Atlantic Council to consider future RSA programs only for those species that are not jointly managed with the ASMFC. This would preclude RSA programs being conducted for summer flounder, black sea bass, scup, dogfish, and bluefish. So all those in favor of this motion signify by raising your hand. Again, I'm just gonna let the hand settle for a second. I have Connecticut, South Carolina, Delaware, Virginia, Georgia, North, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Maryland, New Jersey, Potomac River Fisheries Commission, and Florida, and Maine. Okay. If anybody please call out and I will put the hands down. All right, let me know when you're ready for the call for no votes. I'm ready. All right, all those opposed to the motion signify by raising your hand. I have Rhode Island, New York, and North Carolina. Okay. Uh, any null votes? No null votes. Any abstentions? No officiaries. All right. So let me count this up. So I have 12 yes votes, three no votes, and one abstention. If that matches your count, Tony. I think I had 13 yeses, Bob. Did you have 13 yeses? Yeah, I got 13 also. Yep. So I have okay. 13, three, zero, one. All right. Very good. All right. Um, just uh, in the time we've got remaining between now and three o'clock, um, I'd like to go back to those uh, that second set of questions um, that Tony had uh, read before, uh, just to see if there's some particularly strong feelings from the board about responses to those the questions that we've, we've actually addressed. Number two. Um, how about number one? Um, I think number one would be an, uh, is one that would be interesting to have some feedback on. Um, so does anybody want to comment on that? Uh, Dan McKiernan. All right, go ahead, Dan. 
pardon me for being redundant, but uh, the comments I made earlier about the uh, for hire sector being recipients of quota uh, creates a, a serious incompatible management system. And I, I guess I have an open question, maybe it's for Ryan, as to whether or not a program could go forward where we could exclude uh, the for hire sector from from um, obtaining this RSA quota in the in the fashion that it was done in the past. So maybe maybe Ryan could speak to that. Yeah, go ahead, Ryan. And Ryan, I don't know if you're still with us or not. Okay. All right. Well, obviously, again, uh, this is a work in progress, so there's going to be some some further discussions, I'm sure, as this continues to evolve. Um, yeah, because I had a, a question about what I'm sure there's some critical mass of where you've got to have enough states to opt in to make something be feasible. Um, and I guess that's another issue that would be dealt with on a species by species or fisheries by fishery basis as to whether or not an RSA would be feasible uh, based on the number of states that opt in or opt out. But again, I think, um, you know, we, we're, we're giving, I, I think, guidance to the, the MID uh, clearly about our concerns. Uh, but again, it's, it's advice and it's guidance. Uh, Brandon, just to uh, maybe sort of wrap this up, this will be taken back to the MID and incorporated in future discussions. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Correct. So I am going to, this will be discussed at the August uh, council meeting. So there's time on the agenda, not not a ton of time, but sort of just where the council is. And obviously the big, I think, focus of the discussion will be is, is the feedback that you all provided here. And so I think the council will have at least some initial general discussions about how they want to move forward. But this will be on the August agenda for, for the council. Okay. okay yeah go ahead Tom. i was just going to say bob has his hand up mr chair and then I, and mike ratio put in the comments that just in response to dan's question uh earlier about the recreational fishery he thinks that the answer is it depends it you know it's how how the program is resurrected and what type of direction is provided to the agency just as an fyi but bob had his hand up all right, thanks. So go ahead, Bob. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Hey, I just want to follow up on a couple of the comments about, you know, these these species, the jointly managed species in particular now, you know, do have a number of research priorities that are unanswered. And, um, you know, everyone, no one on this call has really spoken against the value of cooperative research. I think everybody's highlighted the value of cooperative research. So, um, you know, I think moving forward as the commission has its conversations about prior budget, future budget priorities and priorities to Capitol Hill, you know, I think this notion of finding money for cooperative research is something we need to, to, you know, put that higher on our list of priorities or budget priorities for the commission. I think there's a lot of good work that can be done through this um, joint you know, cooperative projects with the industry. RSA, you know, it, based on the vote, it appears the shortcomings of the RSA aren't aren't, aren't the avenue to uh, consider for to, to fund this research. But so I think, you know, just it, unless someone disagrees, as I work on these lists of priorities and, um, you know, talk with folks on Capitol Hill, I'll start, you know, this will be one of the items that I add to the list of our priorities is cooperative research and the need for, um, you know, increased support to get a better understanding of what's going on in these fisheries and support for management. So just a sort of editorial comment that I'm happy to, to help folks pursue, um, you know, state help is always useful when we're talking to uh, congressional delegations on funding as well. So just wanted to, to bring that up, Mr. Chair. No, thank you, Bob. Bob and I talked the other day about, you know, we're coming to the end of a strategic plan and we're going to be uh, uh, involved in another strategic planning process and you know this is the kind of thing that I think the policy board is certainly going to have to consider is how do we go forward to ensure that we're getting the best underlying science-based information we can and uh, if I recall correctly I think the concept of study fleets uh, was a pretty high ranking when we were going through the scenario planning so Again, uh, there's a lot of value uh, 
from cooperative research. Uh, but again, it's how do you fund it adequately and with enough stability to produce meaningful results. So uh, uh, thanks for that, Bob. So, all right, I think we're at the point where uh, we can wrap up. Um, is there any other business to come before the policy board? We've got a few minutes. I do not see any hands raised, Mr. Chairman. All right. All right. I want to thank everybody. It was a good conversation. Uh, and again, you know, this this is a process that we're still in the middle of. I'm sure there will be additional opportunities for the commission to weigh in as the mid continues to deliberate on this. So I want to thank uh, Brandon for being here and Ryan as well. And thank you all, all for your participation. And uh, if there's no opposition, I'll adjourn the meeting of the ISFMP Policy Board. I hope everybody has a good rest of your day.